Ian Dale, this is LBC. Well, we have so many questions coming in. Let's crack on with Lenny in Ashford. Good evening, Lenny. What would you like to ask? Good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. Yeah, my question is, if you justify a lie, are you as bad as the liar? Oh, that's a deeply ethical question there. Um, Nina? Yes, in a way, I think you are, because you are enabling somebody to lie. And I think that you should uh, keep your standards um, and you should speak out when you can. Because it's, you know, standards are very important. Integrity, decency, we all aspire to them. And if we know that somebody is lying, then it's, 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 it's just something that shouldn't happen. It may be something that shouldn't happen, but I doubt whether a single one of us around this table could say that we've never lied in our lives. Oh, yes, we've, of course we've all lied, but we've all done little lies, little white lies, lies to help people, lies not to hurt other people's feelings. This is not the scale of this, the, the lying that we are all talking about at the moment, the scale of, of, of Boris Johnson's lying. But do you believe it was deliberate lying? Yes, of course. Of course it has. He, you know, he's been he's been he's been sacked twice from jobs before for lying. It's not like this is suddenly we've all suddenly discovered that he's a liar. He's, he is a liar. You know, I'm not in the House of, of Commons, so I, I'm allowed to say that. But the country. But the thing is, the latest poll says that 75 percent of the country believes he's a liar. What what does that say about us as a country Why that you... we are prepared to put up with somebody that we cannot trust? And if we, as the people presumably who voted him in, I. I certainly didn't cannot trust him how can other people trust him how can how internationally how can anybody trust well, why him? do you think in 2019 that so many people just wrote that off because it was part of labor's election campaign that look this guy has an ambivalent relationship with the truth jeremy why would corbyn? why would you vote for somebody well, like that? Hey, jeremy corbyn nobody wanted that uh, nobody <laughs> yeah. wanted that Ooh. Enough uh, for my no, 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 no that's true but 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 also because so many people you know wanted brexit and the thing about populist leaders is they have have charm they make you laugh if you look at if you look I'm at sure Donald Trump had a huge amount of charm no, well he obviously has the charm that his voters respond to it's that you know we don't understand it but they do they respond to it on some kind of visceral level and to, he has that charm and you know I remember when he was mayor of London you know before he was dangerous and we you know we thought oh good old Boris and his Latin jokes and his piffle and whiff waff and all that nonsense oh you know he kind of shows us off a treat really he's an he's an individual he's a character and then you saw sort of da -da -da -da, as it got worse and worse yeah. and we thought oh my god this is real um but the, but so the, the charm coupled with Brexit coupled with Jeremy Corbyn there you have it. Okay. John Redwood, let's go back to the question. Are those who are justifying the lie as bad as the liar themselves? I don't think it's a good idea <clears throat> to justify something you know is untrue. And in politics, you only have your word to go on. And if you debase your word, that does get difficult. Uh, but we do see people in senior positions <coughs> feel they have to sometimes be flexible with the truth. I mean, Keir Starmer, for example, was strongly recommending Jeremy Corbyn as the ideal man to be our Prime Minister in 2019. I'm not quite sure that reflected his thoughts at the time, and it certainly doesn't reflect his thoughts today, but I think most people can understand why he took that liberty with the English language. But, for example, Brandon Lewis was out, I mean, Cabinet Minister was out on the airwaves this morning and was likening this to a parking ticket or a speeding fine. And we all know that if you're part of a government, you have to defend your colleagues, and you will have had to do that when you were a Cabinet Minister, mm. defending John Major sometimes when possibly uh, you didn't particularly want to. I was, always did it in an authentic way. <laughs> <laughs> I would find something I could believe in or support. I, I was not very willing to go and support the things I didn't believe in. Uh, Siobhan, that, that's quite an interesting analogy, isn't it? Because, of course, y you were standing as a Labour candidate in the last election, ostensibly supporting Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister, but we all know, <laughs> knew you didn't believe a word of it. But I don't think a person alive, particularly not Jeremy Corbyn, didn't think I supported him. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is true, but... You, I've always you, had a you bit had of a, a problem with being a bit straightforward about leaders. It goes back <clears throat> before Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> Which is it? Yeah, do you no. remember the stuff around Gordon Brown? No. Oh, that's another story. We're not <laughs> opening up that, Lenny. I won't be telling you about how he sacked me on TV. Did he? Yeah. 
I just owned I, it. Yeah. I, did you? What did yeah. you do? Come on, you got to tell us. Now. <laughs> oh, this I, is uh, very exciting. I, 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 I wrote a letter. Um, to the General Secretary of the Labour Party suggesting there should be a leadership election in accordance with the rules and when right. would he be issuing uh, the letters uh, to cause that election? That's not really a clever idea if you want to stay a whip, is it? No. Oh. <laughs> no, I would have to admit that. <laughs> but do, do you think that lying in our politics now is more commonplace than it ever used to be or do you think that maybe because of social media it's just amplified more? I think, you know, to get by... We all, you know, we all in whatever walk of life, you know, as Nina said, you know, perhaps to protect people, perhaps just to have an easy life. But I just think what's going on at the moment is now so debilitating that, you know, what impact are we having on young people looking at mm. politics, whether they want to become involved in it? I mean, we all know that our Prime Minister lied because he thought he could get out of the problems with the party gate, lied and lied and lied and then started to say sorry and it's just so debilitating and when I think about people in the constituency who are at the moment, they're terrified about whether they're going to pay their gas bill, whether they're going to feed their kids, you know people with waiting lists for child and adolescent mental health services whatever's going on, it's a really hard time out there and to have somebody at the head of your country that you can't trust with the small stuff, how do you trust them with the big stuff? OK. Christopher Hope, are you are you bored of writing about Partygate? Because you, you, you've had a, 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 a few good stories out of it, haven't you? Yeah, we never stop. I think I, I think it's a great question, isn't it? It goes back to the idea of what is truth and your truth. And it's, it's a lot of the younger generations and ours talk about, well, I'm offended, therefore, you know, that's my truth. And I think the idea of what is truth is the question mark that we're seeing played out all the time on Twitter. And if you, if Boris Johnson believed when he was drinking his beer in the garden that he was actually following the rules, then, then that's his yeah, truth. Yeah, but he didn't, did he, did he, Chris? He can't but possibly have. But that's what he... That, as the original question from, as re-put by Ian was what the Peter Bone question in the House today was, do you believe you deliberately broke the rules? He said no, and upon that hangs all the defence from the Tory party that John's nodding away uh, of, of, of Boris Johnson. It goes back to the last contempt of Parliament investigation by this Privileges Committee which will decide on Thursday, or, well MPs will decide whether to give it the power to investigate, it was into um, uh, John Profumo mm -hmm. and it's about whether when he was having sex with Christine Keel, did he think did he think at the time he was doing it or not? You know, in the sense of when, when Boris Johnson had the beer in his hand do you think I'm at a party or work event? And it goes back to what is his truth? You and know, that, that, it goes to the that he doesn't this is what's happening in, I'm, I'm, I'm not justifying yeah. right. what, No, Chris, wrong. it's there's not right and wrong. In this case it's black and white and it's right and wrong. Shabon. You can't say it's his truth or my truth or their truth. It, 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 there is the truth but and I there think, is a lie. I think there's another thing going on and that is the rules of the little people, they don't apply to him. They don't apply to the people around him. It's all um, a shimmer. They, they're all gone now. The guys yeah. have been around. Maybe they haven't. But it's all That's a shimmer. They, they haven't. Yeah. It's all a shimmer, isn't Mark, it? Mark Harper was... No, no, no. Mark Harper was sitting in this seat earlier and he said there are still people in number 10 who were at that raucous party the night before Prince Philip's um, funeral. Uh, they're still working there. Now, they may not be in the most senior positions, but there are plenty of people still working there. And so you do have to question why that is, I suppose. Look, let's take an allied question on this. Lenny, thank you for that. Let's go to Ulf in Hamburg. Um, Ulf, what's your question, please? Good evening. Good evening, panel. Good evening, Ian. My question is, is Boris Johnson the Prime Minister the UK deserves? Now, that's a slightly double-handed question, isn't it? Because just explain why you ask it. <laughs> Um, frankly, Boris Johnson is just about the worst person imaginable for that job. Uh, even, but he got voted in democratically. Um, well, basically, I think you Brits need to have your, no, have your nose wrapped in what you're doing. Uh, for years, you have been very hostile to the European project, all the lies, all the gaslighting, all the scheming and plotting, the trying to divide and rule. Um, Frankly, the man who's responsible for that should be your prime minister. Maybe he'll lead you to the uh, uh, summit uplands, and if he doesn't, well, you deserve it. John Rover, we got the prime minister we deserve. Well, we got the prime minister, the, the nation overwhelmingly supported in the 2019 election, and I think we, we got Boris Johnson uh, because he was on the majority side, the Brexit side in the referendum. Uh, he was seen by the Conservative Party, by the membership in particular, 
as the man who would cut through after um, a parliament deliberately tried, tried to thwart the wishes of the British people and thwart the Brexit vote. And that is exactly what he's been doing. And, and that is why he got the big support he got and why the Conservatives are enjoying a majority of over 80 seats as a result of that general election. Indeed, we not only had to win the referendum, which we did in reasonable style, but we had to win two general elections in order to find a parliament that would do the decent thing and understand the democratic wishes of the British people. And I can assure our, our German friend uh, that we Brexiteers are all in favour of a global Britain with a, a strong presence and a uh, friendly approach to our allies on the continent and elsewhere around the world. And I think we've just been showing that we offer enormous leadership to our friends on the continent of Europe over the issue of support for Ukraine. And indeed, we've been singled out and praised by the American allies, who are obviously the senior allies with the most resource, who have also been very helpful to Ukraine as being the other country with them that has been leading Europe in this very crucial uh, question of how we, through NATO, can offer enough assistance to help Ukrainian resistance without triggering a much wider war, which none of us want. Can, can you imagine in the next few weeks, if the Prime Minister gets other fines and the Tories do really badly in local elections, can you imagine getting to a point where you, you might question your confidence in the Prime Minister? I was always taught not to go into hypotheticals in politics. Oh. And we can never be sure what tomorrow might bring. It might be great news, Ian. Why don't you give me well, some factuals that it, it, it say might. Boris is going to have a great but, but, success? But, but, That's but, also but, possible. Because I think it's unlikely. But, That's John, in the reason. old days, you talked about Brexit being a great thing before we left. Why not talk about Boris Johnson and his future before it happens? Well, I'm, I am very positive about what this government can do now that COVID is receding and we're getting back to a much more normal life. Uh, and I'm lobbying and trying to persuade the government to have a much bolder economic agenda. I think they need to do more to tackle the cost of living crisis. I've been um, trying to persuade them with others to sort out our energy problems because there's no reason why the UK should be as short of energy as the continent of Europe is because we've been blessed uh, with great resources of, of wind and oil and gas and coal and all the rest of it. And we need to get out the transitional fuels for the next 10 years because over the next 10 years, most people are still going to have a gas boiler and they're still going to have a diesel or petrol car. So much better to get our own energy out and to make a contribution uh, to dealing with the shortage and the high prices in the world. And of course, work away on how you can have a transition to something greener uh, and a more electrical future. But that is going to take time. It requires a popular revolution. It can't just be done by government. Okay. We will only have an electrical revolution when you've uh, got an electric... I'm, I'm, not quite sure. I'm not quite sure what country John is living in, but it's certainly not the same one as me. We've seen the biggest tax hike since the 1940s, the largest drop in living standards since the 1950s. We've got people who are absolutely terrified about what next October is going to bring for their gas and electricity bills. Which is why bills. I want more to be given. So, I mean, the idea idea that it's all kind of sunny uh, sunny way forward it's completely for the birds we're going to have the lowest growth rate next year of the second lowest of the G20 countries only second to Russia who's going to have the worst so the idea that things are going well you know our, con our economy is contracting um, our people uh, don't know which way to turn. I think life is very, very miserable for lots of people at the moment. OK. Well, well our economy well, grew faster than all the others uh, over well, the last year. Well, because it started um, as low. You base. and I actually agree about something. We think that more ought to be done for people who are facing the hit from... Uh, the increase in fuel prices, and, and I'm very okay. keen that they can do so, and I'm hoping they will. I don't see why they wouldn't. We'll come to Chris and Nina after the break and come to more of your calls, 0345 6060 973. Lots of the calls, very similar subjects at the moment, so if you phone in with something a little bit different, the chances are you'll get on as a tip. 17 minutes past eight. This is LBC. From
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 90 minutes past eight. Siobhan McDonough, Christopher Hope, John Redwood and Nina Mishkov with me answering your calls. 0345 6060 973. And if you've never watched our proceedings, <laughs> uh, you can do so on Global Player. I promise you it's worth it. We have a very colourful panel. Well, two members are very <laughs> colourful uh, anyway. Um, now, we're in the middle of answering Ulfin Hambo's question. Is Boris Johnson the Prime Minister the UK deserves? Chris Hope. Well, I think he was the PM that we need, needed to get out of the Brexit mess. It was a kind of a, a kind of berserker person who could take control and uh, and to to, to to carve a way through. Do you mean berserker or bazooka? A berserker, kind of kind of a, a <laughs> guy who would just uh, would upturn the apple cart back in September 2019 and get us out of the European Union just in time for the COVID crisis to happen. I think he's had to learn new skills in government. I think he's had to learn about being more collegiate, investing more in in, in alliances, which he has very few of them when he became an MP. Doing some work. Doing some work. Uh, well, easy, that's not that's not fair, Siobhan. But I, I think he I think he has he's learnt and he's developed in the job. I mean, he became a, a PM at the height of this crisis, and I think if it weren't for him, we would still be stuck in EU negotiations. I think he certainly was the person, and he's proving himself. I'm, I mean, it's, it's worrying. We have these rows about whether he's telling the truth, and he might you might want to have. He looks in the mirror today. I think, given that he's apologised twenty times or twenty plus times in the comments today, he would do things differently now. Nina? Do you sincerely believe that, Chris? I don't think he'll do things any differently at all. He's, I mean, how, how old is he? He's in his 50s now? He's 56. He's, he's not going to change his ways. He has had these conversations with everybody, with his bosses, the women in his life, um, everybody. He's been saying the same things. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't do it again. Better a sinner than repentant, though. I, I, I don't think he's repentant, though. He's not repentant. He's not shown a single sign of being repentant. And as for somebody that the, the country deserves, the, the, our country deserve, does deserve better. Well, you know, this is a huge distraction. This whole mess, his, okay, his well, failings... If, if, if he goes, uh, who would you want to succeed him? Any, my cat, and my cat's been dead for 20, 10 years. Uh, seriously, anybody... You can't vote for your cat, No, you? I can't, but but you, if you knew my cat, you would. Um, <laughs> no, no, I'm serious, that was, that was a bit sort of idiotic to say that. Um, almost anybody who had a sense of integrity, a sense of purpose, and, you know, they say you, you cannot change horses in mid-stride. We're in the middle of this war with Ukraine. France is in the middle of a general election. They haven't cancelled that, and they're coping very well. This, that is just yeah, the trouble is, leadership a... elections in the Tory party can take five or six months. So what? The thing is, if Boris Johnson fell under the proverbial bus tomorrow, do you think for an instant that the outcome of the war in Ukraine would be changed? Probably not. No. So therefore, we have should have a system. And if the Tory party, after 12 years in government, 12 it seems yeah. longer, um, if they've been in government this long and they cannot produce a single person or a team of people who can lead this country, who can deal with the problems of the economic crisis, or the fuel crisis, and coming out of the pandemic and dealing with Ukraine, then what the hell are they doing as any kind of Shall I have another government? go at trying to get John to ask a hypothetical question? <laughs> if, if Boris did fall under the proverbial bus, who, do you, who would you personally support to, to take over? Well, I have no idea, because I, I don't see well, the bus do. coming. Yes, you do. Uh, but I can Nobody re ever I, sees the bus coming. I can reassure... <laughs> well, sometimes you, you did. did for Gordon Brown. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember seeing the bus coming, political bus coming for Mrs May, and I was actually helping drive it. So um, <laughs> uh, that does happen from time to time. Um, but no, I, I think the Conservative Party has a range of talent. There would be quite a lot of people who would want to take over as leader when a vacancy comes yes. forward. I mean, lots of people want to, but who and are, cap who are, are stood, they capable? John, against John Major. What's your advice to go against standing against an incumbent Tory Prime Minister, given you've done it? Um, don't have strong views as I had, I think would be the best advice. <laughs> I thought you said don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I Ulf. think uh, if you've got too clear an agenda, then you, you upset bits of the party, it's probably better to rise without trace. That's what most of them did. <laughs> oh, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Who are you talking about? <laughs> Let's go to David in Enfield. Hello, David. Good evening, everyone. Um, Hi, what's I, your question? As the Queen is the head of state, the head of the Church of England, and very importantly, head of the Commonwealth, does the panel think that Priti Patel's plan to send UK asylum seekers to Rwanda for processing... Hope resettlement might embarrass the monarchy. 
Oh, wow. Well, would sending refugees to Rwanda embarrass the monarchy? Uh, Chris Hope, you know, I know you're not the Telegraph's royal correspondent, <laughs> but um, you're the best we've got so far. I think the Queen will stay well out of this. I mean, this is a, this is a, a, a political decision that she's not part of. I mean, I think... Um, the Rwanda is in the Commonwealth, we should point out. Is it? Yes. Yes, it joined. One of the, one of the 52? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, it's done. It's not, it's not imposed on, on um, Rwanda. It's a deal done with the Rwandan government. They're happy with it. We're happy with it as, as a government, not necessarily in Parliament, and this caller. Um, the idea is to dissuade people as they go through France and Belgium and Germany from carrying on to Britain. If you go to Britain, you might end up back in Rwanda. So the point is to try and dissuade people from making that journey across the Channel. The idea being, if we're going to take you 4,000 miles to Rwanda, you, you may not come. Um, I think privately they hope it's only going to be young men who, who are taken to Rwanda, and it might be a, a small number, because if this... If the people can see it happening, it may kill off this cross-channel trade, is the idea. And I can see why that works and why it appeals to a lot of people. Nina? It's inhumane. It's absolutely inhumane. Why can't they stay in France? Uh, if why is it humane? In well, for two reasons. One, they, they might speak, be able to speak English and they might be able to do that. But also, we have a black economy where it's much easier for them to work. You know, France, you have to have your papers. They've got everything in triplicate. You know, and it's... I it's do can't encourage it a black economy and, and, and that's the reason... To, to no, 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 I'm saying... That's not, that, I'm not encouraging. I'm saying that's why they come, because they can oh. drift into the system. Well, shouldn't we want to stop that? Mm. Well, absolutely. If it's all illegal, if they come illegally well, yes, and they it, do well, illegal well, work... We are talking about the Home Office that can't get mm. an assignment asylum seeker from Dover to Yorkshire, what is the prospect of them ever getting them to Rwanda? This has got nothing to do with immigration policy. Sure? This, is, this is about it's a dividing line. It's about um, gracing it with a respect to talk about it as a policy. The Home Office is in a complete mess. It can't process claims. It can't remove people. It's certainly not going to move people to Rwanda. This is a trying to get round actually improving the system and make it work. What about the question? Um, well, I don't think it should embarrass the Queen. I think Priti Patel should be embarrassed by her own performance in the House of Commons today. She wasn't prepared to answer any questions. She just abused people in the par in in the party other parties. You know, I mean, this is just a political dividing line. It's about dividing us as a community rather than addressing a problem that I completely accept is real. If you want to stop people coming in boats, you've got to do um, you've got to do uh, negotiations with the French, which may be easier after this Sunday's election, so they can get on with it. You need more police, for God's sake. You need somebody who is actually going to prosecute uh, the people tra traffickers. Because in the last year, how many? do you think we've successfully prosecuted two? two. But why, why and is that? And in 2015, because because the French, 2015, the Belgians, there were 59, the Germans, there were 59 prosecuted We know who these people are, so why aren't they being prosecuted? Well, you would have to have police and you would have to investigate it. And this government are not great at employing the police or getting them to investigate very much. John? Yes, what would you like to know? I'd like to know the answer to the question from David. Well, no, I, I don't think it's embarrassing to the Queen at all. She is above politics, and this will be settled by a, a democratically elected parliament. Um, I think the, the questioner is a little misinformed because we're, we're not talking in the main about asylum seekers. We're often talking about economic migrants who have money, who pay... Uh, people traffickers who then put them at great risk uh, in a rather evil trade. Is it two thirds who who actually finally settle here who are not illegal? Yeah, it's well, two it's thirds between, between two thirds and seventy five percent. Yes, are actually yeah, but that's rather asylum. different from them being in in the plight of an asylum seeker because of course these people are coming from France and so they are coming from a safe country. So the first but, question is: But they're perfectly is, entitled to why don't United they? And, why don't they exercise their right to apply for asylum in France if they don't like the terms on which we might? Offer? I've just said one. I've given mm. you two reasons why they don't want to settle in France, and they're perfectly entitled to move on to the country as the, the 1951 Geneva Convention allows them to move to the country of their choice, to move through countries to get to the country of their choice. That is part of the Geneva Convention of 1951. And we offer legal routes for people who are genuine asylum seekers, as the Home Secretary explained in the House today. Um, uh, tens of thousands of people have, have done it the legal way and have been welcomed and adopted into our country in recent years. And there are those legal routes. We are talking about people who have money, who choose to take an illegal route, which turns out to be very risky and dangerous for themselves quite often, rewarding people traffickers whose business needs to be closed down 
I, I think good criticisms have been made of the police forces and prosecuting authorities around the continent. Uh, and remember that we have been in endless negotiations and agreements with France, um, with, with French, French agreement. We put up all sorts of barriers to people uh, getting on the back of lorries because that was a very dangerous way of coming. We had quite a lot of success in dealing with that. Uh, and we pay money to the French to try and go and hunt these people down because these are criminals on the French side. They're not on our side. It's not our police force who are failing to find these people in, in London or Dover. It's, it, these are people operating on the beaches of Belgium and France. And the continental system, even with our money and encouragement, is not catching enough okay. of them. And I think that's a pity. Uh, um, uh, hang, on, hang on, Chris Hope. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think I can I kind of agree with what John was saying, really. I think the, I think it's an attempt. I was going to ask Siobhan what your idea was, Siobhan. I mean, at least there's an attempt here. You can't just... More money into policing, more money into um, that kind of thing. I mean, this is an attempt, a, a big bazooka, to try and deal with a problem which has plagued this country for 10 years. Chris... They ain't sending nobody to Rwanda. They're incapable of doing it. The border force is at the point of collapse. I can't, as a, I'm a, a London MP, I constantly deal with immigration casework. I direct message poor old Kevin Foster, the immigration minister, more than anybody else, saying, could you have a look at this one? This one's been hanging around for years. You know, we have a system that is in an appalling condition and we're going to do this. Many would say this is what people have voted for in 2016. The, 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 the argument is your everyone's making here is that until that point, until 2016, you can move within the European Union, but since then there has been no, a, a no, vote for control making, over the borders. The point this is an I'm making to is it is the duty of the British government to have a border force that can actually work and is efficiently managed and run, and that is not the case at the moment. And I well, take then up why Nina's are you blocking point. changes I'm to taking, legislation I'm to talking, make it work? I'm talking, um, uh, actually, I'm not voting on it because I actually chaired the committee uh, stage of the bill, uh, but uh, Nina's point about pull factors. If you want to sort out a pull factor, get an ID card system, because oh, you know if, if, you, if you're in France, <laughs> y you need your ID card. You can't go anywhere you talk without with Jackie it. Jackie Smith lately. <laughs> I think you must. Have. Well, as you know, I frequently talk <laughs> to Jackie Smith. I know but, you do. Yeah. She's indoctrinated you. Um, no, now I don't really right. understand this, but George says the more I listen to Christopher Hope, the more I want to sell him a chocolate fire guard. I've no idea what that means. I hope it's not something rude. Anyway, <laughs> we'll come to more of your calls in a moment. 0345 6060973. It's 8.31. Let's get the latest LBC News headlines from Helen Hodinot. Former Chief Whip and Conservative MP Mark Harper has told Boris Johnson he's no longer worthy of being Prime Minister after being fined for breaking lockdown rules. MPs will vote on Thursday on whether to investigate the PM over allegations he misled Parliament. Boris Johnson told the Commons today he offers a wholehearted apology. Theresa May has criticised the government's plans to send some asylum seekers to Rwanda. The former Prime Minister says she doesn't support the proposals on the grounds of legality, practicality and efficacy. Russia has seized its first Ukrainian town since launching its new offensive on the east of the country. Officials in Luhansk say Ukrainian forces have withdrawn from Kremlin as fighting continues across a 300 mile long front. LBC weather turning drier overnight, leaving most areas clear, a low of one degree. This is LBC. Weather
Britain's Conversation Cross Question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. It's 8.35 on LBC. Siobhan McDonough is with us, Labour MP for Mitcham and Morden, serial killer of party leaders. Uh, Christopher Hope, Associate Editor Politics at The Telegraph and host of the Choppers Politics podcast. 30-minute elevator pitch for your podcast. Oh, is, Sorry, 30 uh, seconds, not 30 minutes. Every single um, <laughs> senior politician you can imagine every week in the pub and me and it's breakfast, it's coffee and it's a great chat and it's like this, kind of relaxed. You um, get a lot of news lines out of well, them, don't yes. you? You don't have to go toe-to-toe to, toe to get the best yeah, stories. Exactly right. John Redwood is Conservative MP for Wokingham, former Cabinet Minister, and he has a daily blog at johnredwood.com. Um, blogging is a bit old-fashioned now, isn't it? But you, you, you stuck at it all these years, unlike many others. Well, I have, because I, I like paragraphs. I like to be able to develop an argument and give people some facts and yeah. information and analysis, and you can't do that in the tweet. I do tweet the blog as well, because I do understand <laughs> there are some people short of time who just want the headline, but uh, I recommend the story. You were one of the first bloggers, Ian, weren't you? Oh, back in the day. You really were. Yeah, like in 20 Dale's years ago. Blog, yeah. yeah, it was you a long time it. ago. Uh, Nina Mishkoff is with us, broadcaster and writer. We know each other through appearing on the Jeremy Vine show. Yes, and of course, do. I remember you as sort of nasty Nina back in the mm -hmm. 1980s on New Faces. And you had a newspaper column which you um, would be quite critical of people. I, I, w I was a TV critic, yes. Yeah. And no, I mean, I, I think you all you have is your your critical <laughs> opinion and, and, and your um, you have a genius duty to be honest I mean, <laughs> this kind of theme through there um <laughs> and uh, and sometimes i could be brutally honest you could indeed right let's move on to another question it's harry in waltham forest harry hello good evening good evening panel my question is what do we do next after putin has been allowed to crush the ukraine and turns his eyes on the baltic states well, you're assuming that he will win in Ukraine. Um, Siobhan, do you think that's inevitable? I don't think it's inevitable. I mean, it, it's extraordinary to watch the Ukrainians and their fabulous prime minister and the strength that they have gained uh, as a nation out of this terrible thing happening to them. So um, I have been amazed that way countries have come together to support the Ukraine. Um, personally, I'm a bit of a hawk on these things and I would have had a no-fly zone. Uh, but I don't think we can be surprised by Putin. We watched what he did in Syria. Uh, we watched what he did in the Crimea and we just looked the other way and we're re reaping that whirlwind and trying to, to get back to some sort of respectable state. You, you mentioned Syria there. Of course, it was your party that scuppered any action in Syria. Uh, Ed Miliband. There's another, yeah. another leader that you didn't like. <laughs> well, another leader I think didn't Keir think right. you need to watch your back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thank God every day for Keir Starmer. Do you? Yeah. I didn't vote for him in the Said leadership no election. Ever. No, I say, uh, because he's doing his best. He's bringing, bringing the party to a position which is much more respectable, that you don't feel ashamed of. Um, and I think it's important for democracy. I think it's important for the government, God help us, to have a proper opposition. And, and he's been quite hawkish on to. Ukraine as well, yeah. hasn't he? I mean, yeah, it's sorted out all the NATO, you know, the anti-NATO nonsense that some people in Labour can can try. Uh, so, no, I, I, I think I think... You look at Ukraine and, you know, just nothing but admiration for mm. the bravery of those um, people. If he did win, I mean, let's look at the awful prospect of, of him winning in Ukraine. Do you think he would then automatically look elsewhere? I mean, for example, as Harry says, the Baltic states. You've got to think it's a possibility, don't you? Which is why he mustn't win. One of the reasons, for the Ukrainians, but additionally, mm. in order that he gets stopped and his expansionist plans get stopped and he understands that there is an opposition, that the West is just not going to be weak and turn away. OK, Nina? The thing is, this is kind of part of Putin's long-term plan. I saw um, a documentary on... Um, BBC Four on on um, on the weekend or the weekend before uh, called Putin in the West, which I think was made about ten years mm. ago, and actually could have been made now because you see the long term project that you said all just folding out before. Um, I have a really personal um, um, uh, feeling about this because my father was Polish and he came from the southeast corner of Poland, and he came arrived here five days after Dunkirk with the Polish Free Army. And at the end of the war, he couldn't go back because the Allies gave in to Stalin and they drew the line down and that little southeast corner of Poland became Russia and became Ukraine. So he went to 
what was then called Lviv University. It's Lviv. Mm. And so that was there. And they lost all their lands. My, my grandfather was transported. They were all transported back over the line to where they had nothing. My, my grandfather uh, survived in a cellar for a year eating mushrooms. And that was it. I still have family in Poland. So that, so I feel, so I've been brought up knowing Russia's... So you're actually, essentially, half Ukrainian, you could say. No, I'm not, but I mean, but well, yes, no, I, but, I, mean, I could given say. Where yes, it is given now. where it is now. Yeah. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Um, does that give you a real sort of personal sort of insight it, into it, this? It, it does, and it, because, you know, my my father met my mother. It, he was he was sent to Scotland, and um, the northeast corner of Scotland, with a, it was an officer there, and they, they were all billeted on local um, people. And they were, the army was then, the Polish army was then used to build breeze blocks in case there was a landing by sea. And he met my mother, who was then at, at uh, university. And uh, she remembers that the night that um, Russia came into the war on the Allies' side, you know, Mother Russia, this was the great thing. So she went to meet my father that night and she, she said, I was so happy. And uh, he, she said he'd, she'd never seen him more depressed. And he said, I know that's the end of... That's the end of Poland for me. That's the end of it. And one of his fellow officers committed suicide that night. Wow. So I have been brought up with that knowledge, with somewhere, you know, I, you know, my brother and I used to joke with my mother, you know, oh, reds in the beds, you know, ha, 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 blah, 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 <laughs> reds under the beds, you know. It's, it's not, you know, Russia's not a great big bogey, but, it, but it's been planted there a long time ago. But have, and hasn't Poland done absolutely amazingly with all the, the refugees? If you think yes. they've almost had a million and a half now yes. in a small country, not wealthy, taking them on and looking after them. I think they have just... Um, we've done some fundraising for our local Polish Families Association to, to send money to help the Polish people deal uh, with Ukrainian refugees. And people have just been so generous. John? I don't think um, Putin would attack a NATO country. I think he would be very ill-advised to do that. Uh, NATO has already strengthened their defences by putting more troops on the ground in the frontline states close to Russia and has sent a very clear and unequivocal message that uh, were Putin to send forces across borders into NATO countries, there would be a very large uh, response with the full might of all the allies in NATO responding. So I don't think that is at all likely. <clears throat> like others, uh, I, I've been very moved and impressed by this very dogged and successful resistance so far that the people of Ukraine have, have shown. And their one plea to the West is to supply them with more of those crucial weapons that can try and restrain the, the tanks and the the the, um, the big guns that are shelling the, their towns and cities so so badly, and they've had a they've had a very important interim victory because they have obviously um, removed the siege of their capital city, and forced depleted Russian forces to concentrate now on the poor Donbass where they think they've got the best chance of trying to flatten enough and kill enough people to claim they've captured the entire area. Um, and then presumably try and sue for some kind of peace on that basis. But it doesn't look at the moment as if Russia has the, the capability uh, to uh, take the whole of Ukraine by force of arms. And they, they know that they don't have anything like enough troops to provide an army of occupation, <coughs> given the very hostile attitude of those Ukrainians uh, who've remained and are fighting mm. in their country. So I, I think we, we are in for more of this very punishing warfare. Mm. And the more that the, the West and the international community can apply pressure on Russia, the better, because they have to be pressurized all the time in the media war, in the information war, that their, their conduct is not only completely unacceptable, uh, but that it is self-defeating. Because if this is a country they wanted to liberate and want to govern, how can you govern a place where the people all hate you that you haven't killed, <laughs> and most of them are living underground in fear mm. of you? And most of the buildings have been demolished and economic activity in the leading cities has been halted. I mean, it is self-destruction as well as uh, such a, a dreadful thing on a humanitarian basis. So uh, I, I, I don't look forward to the next few weeks because I think yeah. we're still going to see more brutal war. But I think it's great that Ukraine has made such a strong point. And I think NATO is quite right to say so far and no okay. further. 
Chris Hope. I'll be really quick. I mean, I, I completely agree with what John's saying, but we are going towards a degree of partition, aren't we, in Ukraine? At some point in the future, there'll be the two sides will fight themselves to a standstill, and then what does what does uh, what does the West do? What does NATO do? NATO can't um, sign up Ukraine I'm supposed to be a NATO country, but perhaps we'll we'll be so heavily arm arm it without being in the country as a NATO NATO supporting country. Then that's the future. But so, so you effectively reward Putin by granting him a bit of Ukraine. Well, because... Rachel Johnson said that on LBC a couple not, of weeks ago, and saying, you should have seen the reaction to that, so saying, watch your Twitter feed later. I'm not saying, <laughs> not saying reward him back. Well, I it can, is. I, I mean, he wouldn't have territory, is. which he wouldn't have had before. Well, obviously, we keep encouraging Ukrainians to fight back against Russia, but but, but the NATO troops can't get involved. So, at some point, that, that battle may may end, and we end up with partition but by, by, by default. Right, we'll take more of your calls in a moment. It's 8.45. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. I was joined by Northern Ireland Secretary Brandon Lewis and I tried asking him for a percentage of his staff that were back behind their desks. He didn't know the answer. Doesn't that speak entirely about what the problem is now? They don't actually know what the staffing is of their own department. What do you do all day? You must have seen that this morning. You must have thought as you went out on the round, oh, it's the front page of this paper, it's the front page of that paper. Well, I've got Belfast here and I've got Summer here and I've got Liskiard there and I've got Upper Whoop Whoop. What a pile of cop. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Siobhan McDonough, Chris Hope, John Redwood, and Nina Mishkoff with us answering your questions. Let's go to Andy in Tunbridge. Hello, Andy. Hello, Ian. Um, which party can we trust with law and order against the backdrop of cuts to policing and courts in chaos, loss of community policing, closure of police stations, and appallingly low crime detection rates? Uh, Chris Hope. Well, normally you would say that the Conservative Party, they're the party which has been this, traditionally the party of law and order. In fact, um, when um, uh, uh, Siobhan's friend uh, Tony Blair was re-sorting re re out the Labour Party... One leader she hasn't got rid of. Back in the of. 90s, he said that we'd be uh, tough on the crime, tough on the cause of crime. But I think it has, you know, I think it has, there was a, uh, a suggestion of, well, you know, 10 years of, of not doing so well at law, not law and order. And I wonder whether that's a place where the Keir Starmer will be fighting very hard in the next election. Nina? 
Well, certainly not the Tory party. Mm. I mean, for heaven's sake, been in power and the thing has just gone down and down and down. Yeah. Look at look at look at the, the, the crime rates in London. Look at the low prosecution well, rates a for mayor of London. But they know that's not going to make any any difference when it comes down. Well, he is he, he is commissioner Pardon. of police. In fact, well, well, not commissioner, but he's he oversee he's the equivalent of the police and crime commissioner in other areas of the country. Well, let's country. see now now that Cressida Dick's out. What can what can happen next? I mean, you, you can only do so much if you if you if you if you have a, a Met Police chief that that can actually do something. But as I say, the, the, the rates of you know the rates of 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 of, of prosecution for crime, um, uh, for the rates of prosecution for rape, are shocking. are ch absolutely shocking, absolutely shocking. And you, you know, the thing is, you know, we always talk about oh the days when Bobbies used to walk the streets. You never see a policeman, ever, ever, ever. You never see them. And it's it's just shocking because the, the 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 money's been cut, the rates been cut, the standard of intake is is abysmal, is absolutely abysmal. How come we have people you know, who can c commit crimes and be policemen? How can how can we have that? Why why, don't, why aren't we checking up on their social media, finding out w w what filthy things they do? You know, th this this is just not on. Okay, John Redwood. <coughs> I think that's a very unfair attack on most people in the police. I think we have some very good police people who are very dedicated to their task and there are a few rotten apples which have got pointed out and dealt with as and rightly so and all, all the other police would be very John, ashamed of I think you need their, to uh, be a little bit conduct. more respectful given Sarah Everard and how that wasn't sorted out. I think um, you, I'm sure you're not saying that the, the police uh, don't wish to sort these things out or are not not appalled by things that go wrong. I think they there clearly are. There is a are. question about their vetting, isn't there? If that man could be a police officer, if 48 hours before the murder... I, I, I'm not suggesting I'm, you think mm. this is OK, because it's hard to believe anybody would think it we was OK. We all appalled by it. And we, we obviously shocking. want vetting to be better than it was on that occasion. But I'm making a different point. I'm saying I think most police are, are decent people who believe yeah. in their task and wish to enforce yeah. the law. Then you were saying that the that force was too... itself, the, the organisation um, of the force, <clears throat> therefore is incompetent and is not fit for purpose. Because other, otherwise these things wouldn't keep happening. Otherwise we, we, we wouldn't have these appalling crime rates. But you're clearly going to say, well, the Conservative Party is the best one to trust. Yeah, I think that, and I order, think that our, our current Prime Minister is very dedicated to this. I mean, he is the one who's always campaigning about recruiting the extra police and making sure they have the resources and the sensible But he's recruiting them, them because he's cut them. <coughs> I mean, well, one of fair, the... No, he didn't. It's David Cameron but, that cut them. Yeah. No, he didn't cut well, them at well, all. That's why I'm saying the current Prime I Minister is David particularly keen. David Cameron was a Conservative keen. Prime was Minister. He? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely, but decided to cut the budgets of the uh, police and therefore we didn't have the officers. One of the proudest things for me of the last Labour government was the introduction of the Safer Neighbourhood Police Team. So every area, every ward had a sergeant, two PCs, three police commissioners, community service officers and David Blunkett, the former Home Secretary, was brave enough to introduce the PCSOs in order to have more of a community feel to policing. But that was before the financial crash and Alastair Darling has said that if Labour had won in 2010, he would have been imposing mm. the very same austerity cuts that David austerity, Cameron did. The austerity there cuts is no did money not left, work, we were told. did they? Mm. They clearly well, didn't they work because they not, killed our economy at the same really time. Would it have really been any different under Labour? Yes. They had exactly the Absolutely. same financial plans as Osborne actually carried out in terms but of spending and borrowing. What we know is that years of austerity didn't help the economy, that we're actually in a situation without growth, without improvement in our productivity, because we just nailed the economy to the floor during those years. Um, should we move on to a, a question which I think you might have some rather amusing answers to? Um, but before we do that, let's go back to Andy in Tunbridge. Um, Andy, I think I recognise your voice. You're a, you're a slightly famous Andy, aren't you? I'm about famous. I've been in the police for quite a long time in three different police forces. It's just interesting to, to, to listen to this debate. I mean, we know about the cuts. It's really how we're going to go forward on this. And what I find so desperately disappointing is when I see police station after police station being closed, you know, for financial reasons. And I like the one in Tunbridge. Like the one in Tunbridge. Well, Tunbridge Town is open, but Tunbridge Road is shut at night. Paddock Wood has just been shut and demolished. I was the rural sergeant there. And most of my, my team's successes came from talking to local community, to answering their yeah. calls and dealing with it. And now, 
Yeah, we can't, you know, we, we're not going to get back to that all the time we keep cutting and centralising. And I have total sympathy with the reasons why they're doing it. But we, this is fundamental. And you did a programme the other week, didn't you, about what happens when you call the police. And it can be yeah. desperately disappointing for so-called low-level crime. Well, I disorder. did call the police on, on um, when was it, Saturday night? Um, because we were following somebody who appeared to be a drunk driver and I wanted yeah. a patrol car to come and intercept them because it was a really dangerous situation, but there was none available. They did actually visit the person's home the next day and um, continue their investigation, so that, that worked. But that is the thing, when you call the police, you kind of expect an immediate response, yes. but you, you often don't get it for some of the reasons that have been articulated today. And um, Nobody's spoken up for the Liberal Democrats' tr police policy, Andy. Are you going to do that? <laughs> No, I mean, I just listen. Sarah Jones was talking about this sort of return to community hubs the other day. But the trouble is the police are under huge demand. Every single report that comes out says they've got to spend more yeah. time on whatever else it is. But, and we because, all know that public sector is under pressure. But this is a fundamental right of people to, be, to, to call the police to get an answer and to get their crime investigated, no matter how minor. Chris, you want to I was going to ask you that, and did you think? Do you worry about priorities in the policing? Uh, worrying about um, you know different different um, LGBTQI um, anything really? You know, did you worry that they that like all big um, organisations are getting distracted by 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 virtue signalling when in fact what people want to see is a policeman on the streets, someone who can answer Ian's call. No, I, I don't. I mean, the, the time taken up by that is tiny compared to what is published in the papers about it. I mean, police custody suites will, will be packed tonight. They're packed every night of the week. The, the police are working their socks off. And they, but they are rushing from call to call. It's what we just fire brigade policing. And your, uh, Ian's experience of the night is common to so many people. You want to call the police. You want to tell them about a suspicious person or whatever. That's why they cannot respond. We can't just blame them. We've got to do something about it. Mm. Um, and yet, in a time when we also know that the whole public sector finance is under huge pressure. Andy, thank you very much for your call. He was former Chief Constable of British Transport Police, you know. <laughs> uh, right, uh, let's go to a text question from Margaret in Crouch End. Is the government's plan to cut train prices by half a joke, as the online video with Grant Shapps would suggest? Now, if uh, many of you won't have seen this online video, but Grant Shapps, the Transport Secretary, has made this video promoting the fact that lots of fares are going to be cut uh, over the next month and encouraging more people to get back to going on the train. Um, now, Chris Hope, you're the only one on the panel that's actually seen this video. Yeah. Just explain it, will you? Well, I loved it. It's uh, a green screen, which means that the background can be anything. You can be, it can be pictures of anywhere, uh, Egypt, I think, out of space, and, and Shaps is hurriedly trying to put on clothes to match the, the green screen. It's very funny. It's like a kind of um, Anton Deck sketch you might see on Saturday night. I think Shaps does it very well. You know, he's the born salesman that we remember when he was poor Tory party chairman back in the, in the, in the teens under David Cameron. I think it's fun. I think he's, of all the Tory ministers, I think he's the one who's taking the fight to social media and demonstrating, you know, half price rail fares off peak. You know, what's not to like? But if, of course, when a politician has a little bit of fun in terms of trying to promote... I mean, if it was just saying, well, I am the Secretary of State for Transport and I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that you can get some bargain fares. Well, no-one's going to watch that, no, are no, they? It's true. And yet, when they do these slightly off-the-wall things, people then have a go at them yeah. for not taking things seriously, Nina. Well, it's not a question of not taking them seriously, but the time spent on doing that, couldn't he have been doing something else? <laughs> oh, please. I mean, no, seriously. Oh, we're all talking about it, so it's working, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's working. It's it's. Oh, it's off peak and it's you're, yeah. you're a former tv critic yeah you should like the stuff it's like acting do you know it, there's just something rather unedifying about okay. it you know it's just a bit cringy oh Chivalry. dearie me what Chivalry. a miserable way of looking at it <laughs> <laughs> why not have a bit of fun and let people get some cheap rail fares what's the problem i'd rather they are rather rail fares were cheaper all the time we've had extortionate fares we've had you well know, then you're going to get rooked on your taxes even more than you are at the moment <laughs> well the, they got to pay the bill somehow nationalize the railways and it well, they are nationalized Chivalry. 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 Well, no properly Come i've on. not se i've not seen the video if it attracts more people to get on the train it's fine by me go on have a have a look at it after the show yeah. it is worth it's it's on my twitter feed but sort of earlier in the day i retweeted it if you want to have a look at it there are a lot um, of seats to fill and the mm. railways have been losing a packet ever since covid hit because their main business has collapsed yeah. 
because people aren't doing five day a week commuting. But they've desperately got to find some new business, otherwise the cost structure is unsupported. But they're doing nothing for the commuters. This is not really mm. co commuting. Well, half of the commuters. Well, they're doing other are, things for the commuters, and, and there are more flexible tickets. And I and others have been advocating more flexible approach because maybe people want to do three day a week commuting rather than yep. five day a week commuting, and you need to make or, sure. Or no day a week commuting incentives. if you work for a government department. Oh, bit of biting satire well, there. Particularly the home um, office. Lucy in Portsmouth has a similar question. She says, Imagine you could make use of Grant Shapps' new scheme after the show today and shoot off on a train to some other part of the UK for a lovely holiday. Where would you go, Siobhan? <laughs> um, uh, we had a, a school friend of my sister's come and stay for the weekend and she comes from Corsands in Cornwall. So oh. I think I'd like to go there. OK, John? Yeah, I'd like to go back to Cornwall. I think it's a great place and the weather's at last warming up. It'd be really nice. Cornwall does feature in the Grant Shapps video. <laughs> you see, it's working. Two of you want to go there. Chris. Without seeing the Liverpool. video. <laughs> I'd go to Liverpool from my, my parents. It's Liverpool. Okay. Uh, I'd say I'd say Cornwall too, but if you say too many people say Cornwall, the entire <laughs> west yeah. of the country is going to tip into the sea. <laughs> so I'd probably say St Andrews, where I was born and where I live for a time. But of course it doesn't have a train station. Does it not? Lucas. No, Lucas. RAF Lucas next. Well, there you go. Well, thank you all very much indeed. If you missed any of tonight's show, or if you missed any shows last week, you can catch up on the podcast feed. John Redwood, Siobhan McDonough, Nina Mishkoff and Christopher Hope will have you back very, very soon. In a moment, we're going to return to the subject of the day, Boris Johnson making an apology in the House of Commons. But, of course, there is some analogies to draw here with Nicola Sturgeon, because she has been criticised for not wearing a face mask, can you believe? Um, um, people are saying that she should resign. Police Scotland have been in touch with her. She hasn't had a fixed penalty notice. But are we judging Nicola Sturgeon by a different standard to the one that we judge Boris Johnson by? 0345 6060 973. You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's one minute past nine. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, Boris Johnson has said he offers a wholehearted apology to the House of Commons after being fined for breaking lockdown rules. Today was the first time the Prime Minister faced MPs since he received a fixed penalty.